Well, uh, a really special show this morning. Uh, and I don't say that lightly. Um, I think what you will very quickly realise is James is a very special person uh, in the world that we occupy. Um, I first saw James speak in 2014 as part of the Marketing Academy Fellowship Programme. And that year was quite intensive in terms of you know, very fortuitously hearing many, many people speak. Uh, and, and honestly, James was the standout in terms of leaving uh, a memory and an emotion. Um, and this morning probably will be quite emotional because James's story is one of tragedy to triumph. And I mean extreme tragedy to extreme triumph. I mean, it really is, uh, you know, the, the highs and lows of life. Um, just a very short story, uh, which sort of tells a picture of the man. Um, I wanted James to come in and talk to Direct Line, um, to really just to do exactly the same thing, to sort of inspire the, the marketing team there. And uh, it was all set up, I think, for a, you know, a Wednesday lunchtime. And I got a call, I think it was the Friday from James's manager saying there's been a bit of a problem. And oh, no, no, that's, that's, that's bad news. What's wrong? He said, well, James has just been diagnosed with bowel cancer. I said, that's terrible. That's terrible news. I am so hope that he's going to be fine. And then James's manager said something which really surprised me. He said, he, he's got obviously got quite a few hospital appointments, but he, think he, might, he thinks he might still be able to come in on Wednesday because he's committed and, you know, he's, you know, he's made that commitment to you. And I said, honestly, that, no, 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 no. First things first, uh, James needs to get well. Uh, and, you know, brilliant if he can come in at some later point. But it just, James was wanted to come in despite everything because that's just kind of the kind of guy he is. I think he'll, he left an indelible mark on me and he will on you. Uh, and it's going to be so brilliant to hear your story, James. So fabulous to have you on the show. I'm so pleased that you've been able to join us. Welcome, James. Yeah, hi, good morning. Yeah, thanks Thanks for having me. Yeah, lovely hi. to have you on. So, um, Richie, I'll hand to you, say a few words and get us started. Of course. Well, uh, look, James, for me as well, I mean, what, a, what an honour to have you on here today, just to the sort of the depths of, of, of life that you've experienced is, is absolutely inspiring. And uh, coincidentally, I heard you speak two years after Mark did, and we never exchanged notes on this till quite recently, but you, you left a, a mark on both of us um, in many different ways. And, and clearly it's really kind of propelled me to do what I'm doing today on the back of some of those words that you said, that I think it was in 2016. So you clearly made a big impact um, in, in many other ways, but clearly in a very small way on both myself and Mark too. Um, also, what, what's surprising me and, and perhaps delighting me is the fact that, uh, you know, you're sort of almost from my neck of the woods, too. So we just shared commonality being from Dumfrieshire as well. So perhaps all great people are from there. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> certainly some of the people we've come across on the show have been close to that, that part of the woods as well. But it's great. It's great that we share that in common as well, James. Um, you know, James, we, we usually start off by kind of kicking off and saying, you know, how was last year? How was COVID for you? But actually... I want to change tax lightly this morning, um, only because I think there is sort of something a little bit more impactful and greater that, you know, you're, it would be good for you to share, which is just your journey so far, perhaps how it began um, and, and sort of where you're at to, to date. So I just want to give you that, give you that time to, to be able to just kind of vocalize, where, you know, your, your story and, and how it's been. Brilliant. Thanks. Yes, yeah, it's great. Um, so, uh, yeah, James Brett, uh, born Swindon, Wiltshire, second eldest of five children. Father worked for Nationwide Building Society. Um, mother, my my mum was a house housewife, and um, she brought us up as a, she was also a foster parent. So, uh, my mother fostered nineteen children through the um, through the period of my childhood, um, all under the age of two, or all, all on the vulnerable list. So, um, you know, babies used to come with black eyes, broken arms, all sorts, and she nursed them back to uh, to health and um, and so on. Um, yeah, so life seemed, uh, life seemed, you know, as a child, how, you know, how a child perceives life to be seemed pretty normal. We, um, you know, used to, you know, just went to school, went on holiday once a year, stuff like that, down to Dawlish. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we'd, um, you know, we'd go to church on a Sunday. My grandfather was the head of our church. Um, he always used to sort of say I was his favourite. Uh, you know, I'd have to, I'd have to go as, a, as a child, I'd go around and, you know, help him cut his grass and whatever else, wash his car and all the rest of it. Um, from the age of uh, from the age of nine, um, he, uh, he he started sexually abusing me, um, and uh, this started uh, in his garden shed. Where he, where he, on the first experience, he sexually abused me and beat me with his belt. Um, and this he gave me fifty pence. Um, funny, even even still today, I always spend the fifty pences in my pocket quicker than anything else. But um, anyway, so that 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 was uh, I was systematically sexually abused for the next four four and a half five years of of my childhood 
Um, at the age of 13, we had a very protective childhood because of our, uh, because of our um, sort of religious upbringing and everything. And um, at the age of 13, I, you know, in school, sex education classes, the, um, the teacher explained about, uh, you know, birds and the bees and sex and all the rest of it. And it's like a light bulb came out. I didn't have a label for it. And I, now I realised what was happening to me. I thought, oh, that's what he does to me every week. Anyway, now I um, now I knew what he was, what it, what it was. I you know I, I understood what it was. I could now felt like I could try and deal with it. So I started avoiding him. I avoided him. Avoided avoided, avoided him. My um you know he used to preach at different churches around um, the southwest. And uh, my uh, father, who it was his father, my father used to uh, get me to go with him. And uh, one Sunday I said, I'm just not going. I'm not going. It wasn't happening. Whatever happened, it come to head. It was never going to happen again. So I um, became hysterical and I told my father what had happened. And um, I said, go and ask your father. His, um, his father denied it the first time and I was hysterical. He went back around to his father's house and he admitted it. And he came back and said, yeah, he's admitted to you know, sex abuse. And my grandfather resigned from the church and went to another church the next week. The following day on the Monday, um, my mother, she called social services. And Mr. Mabley, who was a senior social worker, came up to the house. And then he said, I'm glad you called, Carol. He said, I... Uh, I want you to um, have another baby. And she said, um, she said, oh, I'm sorry, but I, I couldn't take my own children. You have to take me off your care list. I can't foster any more children. And um, a year before that, much to my own mother's embarrassment, she'd won Super Mum of Wilkshire, um, you know, sort of county competition. And, you know, it was in the newspaper for all her good work and whatever else. Anyway, after uh, she stopped fostering, she became withdrawn. And she um, uh, jumped off a car park and killed herself. Um, you know, lost her life to suicide. Um, you know, phew. you know, I have to express that, of course, when when that happens to you, you know, life could, life it feels at the time will never be the same again. What what I can, what I also can express today, you know, gratefully express today is that, you know, pain is an amazing thing. You know, it's an amazing thing and it can destroy you. And it destroyed me for 20 something years of my life. The pain that I suffered from the abuse and the loss of my mum to suicide. Um, but it can also define you and it can break down boundaries. It can enable you to go far in your life, you know, way beyond whatever one can imagine one can go, could, you know, can reach what points one can reach, you know. Um, anyway, so, you know, I, uh, what happened, we buried my, uh, buried my mum. My grandfather, uh, the, 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 the funeral took place in uh, our local church. Um, only at the time, only uh, my grandfather and my father and one or two church elders knew about the abuse. Um, and I just ended up uh, going on, basically went on a sort of one man. I was against everything. I was so angry, withdrawn. I was dysfunctional. Yeah, you know, I was, I was a mess, mess up. I took drugs for 20 years, ended up in and out of young offenders institutes, um, prison, uh, psychiatric hospitals, you know, I was under the mental health for 20 something years of my life. Um, and then uh, in 1999, I was, uh, I, I used travel as a way to, uh, to escape really. And then um, in 1999, I was, um, I was, I went to Pakistan for the first time while I was on the street there, drank pomegranate juice. Um, an old man was blending fruits. He blends some pomegranate juice. I drank it. I said to a friend of mine, I'm going to make a drink from this. I created a drink called Pomegranate, which went in every single supermarket in the UK um, by the time it hit the shelves, like 2002, 2004, um, I had a breakdown. All my past caught up with me. Um, I had a breakdown, ended up in a psychiatric hospital in Scotland, in southern Scotland, um, on and off for 18 months. Um, came out of that hospital in the end, was an outpatient, started doing counselling for child sexual abuse. Um, I got really well. I was taken off the mental health in November 2000 and, um, 2006, um, in April 2007, I went to Afghanistan. I was invited to Afghanistan to talk to farms about growing pomegranates. In Afghanistan, I, um, uh, I, I just saw the, you know, it was April and it was uh, opium harvest time. I just saw the heroin, I'd, you know, with all my own drug taking. Um, I took every, almost every drug you could except for heroin. Um, and funny that every time, I, uh, every time I came across heroin, it was like a sign for my mum saying, don't do that, don't do that, it, it'll kill you and all the rest of it. Um, anyway, lots of friends of mine had passed away from her and stuff like that, and I just wanted to do something about it. So I um, I went to, to, to drove, drove up to Kabul and uh, gave my talk 
um, into these farmers at the seminar. And on the way, leaving Afghanistan, I ran into a field of opium farms with a banner that said pomegranate is the answer. And I spoke to one farmer and I asked him to, uh, to work with me to grow fruit and not opium. We, uh, we, we, we planted his land with trees and, um, uh, you know, I went back there and planted the land with trees. The knock-on effect of doing that was ended up on national television there. Uh, hundreds of farmers pledged to, uh, to grow normal crops instead of opium. So uh, we, um, over the last sort of 13 years, from April 2007 till now, we put together a national strategy. We um, created a range of food products. We uh, trialled the concept into Sainsbury's where he chose Holland and Barrett, places like that. You know, I've been going around the world telling my life story. You know, we, we built a foundation up. Um, you know, our sort of main influential supporter is the Prince of Wales, um, who gets regularly updated on our project. Um, in the last uh, in the last year and a half, um, through COVID, we've been working with uh, UNCCD, so the United Nations Convention on Combat and Desertification. Um, we put together a national strategy um, at the moment with a budget of two point six billion dollars that's been approved for um, funding, um, and literally, I'm on here today, um, waiting for the president of Afghanistan, it should be in the next few days, um, a, a, a phone call um, confirming uh, approval of our national strategy so we can um, roll it out across Afghanistan. And, you know, once we, um, once we start rolling it out, the United Nations want to do another, um, up to another 10 countries with us. So, um, you know, there's, there's a cinema cinema movie in my life under development at the moment Rick Astley the singer his wife's um, developing that and um, you know I'm a father of four amazing children the oldest 27 the youngest seven um, you know and I, I've, I've, I have a great existence and my mother she, she pushes me shoves me forces me you know to get on and um, deliver something good in life and you know I had a lot taken from me and I'm, I'm going to give a lot back and, 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 and that's who I am you know Life's great. Wow, James. I mean, it's the third time I've heard <laughs> your story, plus the Becoming X video, which we, we put out that everyone should should could watch as well. I mean, it, it really leaves a mark. Uh, it's just so striking that you've had so much difficulty and yet there's no bitterness. And I just, I'm just intrigued to know what, why do you, what is it about you that has managed to let go of the bitterness that you must have felt through some of the things you've experienced? Um, I, I had 20 years of um, anger, Mark. You know, I had 20 years of anger, 20 years of, um, you know, psychological problems, um, you know, lots of pain and suffering, obviously. You know, I was angry. I felt let down by my grandfather. You know, I, um, you know the loss of my mother was obviously very soul-destroying for me. I blamed myself for my mother's death for 20 years until I, you know, got into recovery. And... Um, you know, it's clear that it's clear that, you know, within me, my mother's character shines through. There's no doubt about it. And, um, you know, pain, which is something that I experienced beyond what I could possibly cope with. I can't, you know, I can't. You, you, the pain that I suffered is more than I could cope with. And that in itself is a powerful gift. It's so powerful. It's unbelievable that. Obviously, we shy away from pain, but pain has been one of the greatest attributes of my life. Once you address that pain, what boundaries do you have? You know, I've been kid I was kidnapped in the early days in Afghanistan, taken to a, a mud compound in the, in the middle of nowhere for four hours. When they realized they went and checked me out, when they realized who I was, I mean, obviously, I, I didn't know what was going to happen to me. When they realized they came back and were all apologetic and said, Oh, we're, we're really sorry, where do you want to go? You know, I said, Just drop me at the side of the you know, side of the village where you where you just stole me from, basically, you know, and off I went to Kabul. Such is life, you know. So, you know, my mother's uh, my mother's memory will not be in vain. People do not commit suicide. People do not commit suicide. They lose their life to it. You know, if I'm depressed and I end up in a psychiatric hospital, it's not visual. Only you can see from how I'm acting. Maybe I'm depressed. You know, if you break an arm, it's, there's a plaster cast. It's visual. People who are losing their lives to suicide. They don't commit something. You commit bank robberies, you commit shoplifting, you know? And, um, you know, I can't have, I just can't have it that someone as special and as, you know, wonderful as my mother. And memory's not in vain. Mm. You know, James, I will. What a, yeah. yeah what, a, what, a, what a powerful thought 
to be honest with you, and, and such a lovely reframe on what is a, a terrible condition. Um, mm. and, and more so, I mean, your anecdote there, I mean, is incredible and perhaps so far left field from anything anybody on this in this audience or I or Mark would have ever even had to have faced. And so what a, what a tribulation that you've sort of almost brushed off given the other things that you've had in. So what strength and what inner strength that you're just displaying in that, in that small example. Um, James, can I ask, one of the things that, you know, as you were sort of going through and, and perhaps at the embryonic start of the, the, the pomegranate movement, you, you mentioned that you were in Pakistan. And then of course, the second place was Afghanistan. It feels like travel maybe have had, has had such a important component in maybe you finding, finding your purpose almost in that way. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I think um, I think physically running away was um, was was you know what I did. I tried to run from my problems. You know, I, I used to look at the UK with disdain because I felt you know let down by the church, let down by my grandfather. Um, you know, the 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 the, the, the police um, were aware of what happened and they interviewed me once and they said we don't want to do anything to your grandfather, you know, except for what he's done to you. He's an upright member of the community. You know, he's a, he's a vicar and all this sort of stuff, you know. So I felt let down by the police. So I was, I, you know, basically felt, felt, felt there was a massive injustice. So at travel, um, you know, travel enabled me to, 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 to be free from that. You know, every time I left the UK, it was a relief. You know, I used to uh, wave goodbye at the airport or the ferry terminal with disdain, you know. And I had to, you know, I had to recognize that, no, you know, you know, don't, don't, you know, I had to come back and in my recovery enabled me to, to rationalize, uh, you know, how, how it was. But travel was an amazing thing. It's a character builder. You know, I, I helped fund a, um, helped fund a uh, 75 um, children uh, orphanage in, um, in India uh, for a while. And, um, you know, I took my two eldest daughters um, they, uh, you know, they were in middle school, so they, I think they were around about, you know, um, one, I think one was maybe seven and the other was uh, 10 or 11 or something. And I put them in that orphanage in India and the teacher in southern Scotland told me off for taking the children out of the school and putting them in the orphanage. And then they did it. They were doing a subject matter on a few, few weeks later, doing a subject matter at the school in Scotland on different world religions. And my daughters went to, uh, to the school and gave a talk at that age on religion in India. And the headmistress of the school called me and said, I'm ever so sorry that I, uh, you know, moaned at you for taking the children out. What an experience you gave them. They said, she said it was a better education than and me. I, you know, on my LinkedIn, I think it says, uh, you know, this, the school of diverse experience is the school that I attended, you know, and that diverse experience comes from travel. Travel's a phenomenal thing. It defines us, it builds characters. You know, it's um, it's it's a, a richness of life. You know, it's wow. It's uh, you know, I, I've been to ninety-one countries. I'll I'll, I'll reach a hundred soon. But uh, you know, it's just great to be able to see the, the gift of the world, which is travel. James, it strikes me that you you've made some just very instinctive decisions along the way. I'm going to uh, create a pomegranate business. I'm going to take my daughters to to India. Do, do you just sort of always know the way forward? Um, do, you know, do you know what it is, Mark? And uh, it, it's, it, I also put this down to, um, to, 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 to pain. When you, um, the difference between, if you, if, you, if you lose all your attributes of, you know, what we class as a human, um, you know, pain takes a lot of them away. And if we lose that, then what do we become? We are, through our trauma, we only live instinctively. Like animals, and when I, you know, I came out of prison once, and um, you know, at the age of uh, twenty, and in, in, you know, and I was uh, homeless, and I didn't go and uh, I didn't try to get a flat or a bed or anything. I moved to a forest, and I lived in that forest instinctively, and I lived as an animal would live, really. You know, I washed in the stream, I brushed my teeth by chewing bark and spitting it out and whatever else, you know, and yeah. Everything I did before my recovery was instinctive. I lived instinctively. There was no gray area. Everything was black or white. I don't do gray. I rephrase that. Today I do gray. I embrace gray. I love gray. Gray is my favorite color. When the sky is gray, today it's gray in southern Scotland. But I look outside, I'm happy with gray. I don't need blue. 
you know? And so, you know, setting up a pomegranate business or plant for peace or whatever, it's just who I am, you know? Instinct is a powerful thing. And, um, you know, I've been, you know, I've been gifted with, um, you know, with, uh, with, with, with the sort of uh, vision and insight is uh, something I've been gifted with. You know, I'm a strategist. You know, where do I come from? I haven't got a university degree. I didn't do any exams. I think the only exam I sat at school was maths, finished it in nine minutes, got CSE. I don't have any letters after my name, um, you know, but I had to use my wit to live on the street to, you know, to, to, to get through. The places will go, what a book, you know, to, to, to follow that and meander through life is, um, is, is, is what I've, you know, I've been gifted with the opportunity of doing that. You know, James, not only would I say, you know, you talk about the instinct and, and, and the ability to kind of, as you say, meander, um, but actually what you've now done is created a, such a significant movement and been able to really influence a range of different stakeholders to be able to achieve that. And I'd just like to dig in deep a little bit around that as to how you were able to, you know, starting off, by the way, from the side of the road in Afghanistan, talking to the farmer, to then be able to influence the Afghani prime minister and the UN. I mean, there is a, a whole, you know, range of things that have happened in between. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you were able to achieve that, uh, that road to growth uh, through that journey? Yeah, I think um, uh, need, yeah, obviously there's, uh, there's a need, to, lots of problems need to be solved in this world. And, and, and you know, there's a, there's a need to solve the problems in Afghanistan, you know, for, for outside and inside Afghanistan. And, you know, I, I needed a lot, a lot needed to happen in my life. You know, I was I was I was suppressed and ostracized. That's how I felt, you know, through the journey of the trauma that I suffered. My actions for every action is a reaction. So there's a there's, you know, there's a need and um, there was a need then it needs to be fulfilled. And when I first went to Afghanistan, I was shocked by what I saw. The people in Afghanistan did not do not need to live how they're living. Now, today, they're, 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 most of the rural Afghanistan is living like 1,500 years ago. And I saw the efforts of all the international community trying to solve all these problems. But the, 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 the way they solve them is too bureau, bureaucratic. So I saw that one of the stumbling blocks to be able to achieve and grow in this situation was bureaucracy. So if you start your own organization, you can determine it's bureaucracy. And, you know, for example... You know, our, 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 our role, our position in, um, in Afghanistan as country number one for us is to uh, globalise its produce. You know, so how do you take, you know, as you say, someone stood on the side of the street, for example, looking at that country, how do you globalise that produce? You've got to create a network. You've got to create an international network. You know, you've got to go from the man on the street all the way to knowing everybody. So you've got to knock doors. But in a place like Afghanistan, of course, you know, you stand out if you do something like that. I burnt, um, I burnt, I burnt uh, 13 tons, roughly about $780 million worth of drugs on a big pile in Afghanistan, in eastern Afghanistan. Ended up on all, all three international, uh, all three t national television things, uh, television programs doing it, which stuck me on BBC World News and whatever else. Before you know it, people come to you. We had 100 and, 109, I think, production companies contact me after that coverage wanting to do documentaries on plant for peace. We just weren't ready. We had to build our network. Telling the life story uh, got it out there, you know, but when there's a need and there, when there's a need and a significant need, then obviously, you know, that enables you to open doors because people can see that you're meaningfully trying to, um, you know, fulfill those needs. And, and it just yeah. spiraled and spiraled and spiraled. You know, I, when I ran into that field of opium farmers, I came off the mental health on November the on November the twenty seventh, two thousand and six, and I ran into that field twenty second of April two thousand and seven, after being on the mental health for twenty seven years. Just a few months later, I ran into that field. I've never looked back since. Not from what I went from one farmer to regularly having to update people like the Prince of Wales. Um, you know, it's it's phenomenal. The, the journey's been phenomenal, but you know. One has to dig deep, push on and keep going. Amazing. Yeah, so true, James. I just want to read out a couple of things some people have said in the chat. Um, so, Roger, amazing fight back. It's how you get up after being knocked down. That's real strength. Claire Kennedy, what an absolutely incredible life story. Uh, what an amazing, inspiring journey. Wow, wow, I'm lost for words. A lifetime of pain, now a life full of purpose. 
what story incredibly powerful so uh, as ever james you you really you really connect with people and, and and i think it's so obvious that you you care a lot and that's your mother living on in you yeah i, I want people to get a sense of scale of plant for peace because i know you're pitching now for billions and to take this globally so this is this is not a small thing this is a really big thing and he's used to talked about converting land from growing death to growing life creating life so what what's possible for plant for peace um i you know when i started plant for peace i didn't have a clue uh, where where it would go only i knew there was a big need you know and um you know it's grown and blossomed to this scenario you know we we held uh, seven tribal gatherings in afghanistan the largest was 14 and a half thousand people two and a half thousand taliban you know we've crossed we've crossed boundaries that you know nations have not been able, you know governments have not been able to cross but it's only about humanity it's only about being real and being true and genuine with the people and you know we've got to a point now where there's a level of sincerity in afghanistan you know i, I i'm uh, two weeks ago i was in afghanistan you know in 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 the houses of some of the senior taliban there and they embrace it like crazy they, they love plant for peace they just say well what an opportunity for all the people and there's nations around the world that have got similar situations. So many, you know, we, we, we've had, uh, we've had discussions with, uh, with the UN over, you know, replicating this model, another 10 countries. And, you know, for me, for me personally, um, you know, I want as many small older farmers around the world in conflict, whether that's in conflict as nations, you know, fighting or whether that's in a conflict like my own inner conflict, I want as many as possible to be part of Plant for Peace, to all have, all thrive, strive and have, um, you know, good, good financial rewards for the produce that they, and they, that Plant for Peace enables them to put into supply chains and globalise. You know, all of us have a common denominator. There's one common denominator, it doesn't matter what our religion, our background, where we come from, anything. The one common denominator that we all have is we have a responsibility to feed our families. And I want to help as many of those type of people feed their families. And that, you know, the scale, I mean, you know, if I have my way, Plant for Peace will be the biggest social impact, um, you know, food organisation in the world. Why not? Why not? What, what an incredible vision and clearly making, ma making major strides already in that, in that way. So um, everything open. I just want to read a, a comment from Joke here. And she says, the gift of instinct, the freedom from travelling, real living, clarity of thought. Giving because we've just received much. Great perspective of black and white and not gray. Purposeful living without looking back. What wisdom. Thank you so much, James, for coming, coming all out um, to connect with your beautiful story. So just an, another great, great anecdote there. Um, James, I want to I wanna ask, now clearly, um, as, as much as it's a tremendous cause, there must have been a people who, um, who were resistant um, on the other side to be able to make this happen for you. For their own selfish reasons, of course. How were you able to? First of all, did you have any sort of major setbacks as part of this? Probably there must have been too many to count, but some major ones. Um, and then, how were you able to sort of overcome those those setbacks to still kind of push on with the movement? Um, I think the uh, I think the I mean the biggest the biggest um, situation, funnily enough, with um, Plant for Peace has been um, you know keeping it going financially. You know, because, you know, obviously, uh, you know, there's a foundation, Plant for Peace Foundation, which is uh, planting trees in Afghanistan. Um, and then there's a commercial side. We, you know, we had to create a commercial side to be able to develop, make food products and um, supply them into the retailers. Um, you know, so financially, you know, it's been 14, you know, we're, our, we're in our 14th year. I mean, you know, please, uh, please recognise that 14 years of, uh, of pushing and shoving, you know, most people would probably give up a long time ago, but that's just the way it is. There's, there's, there's no going back, of course. Um, you know, so you know, the biggest stumbling block has been uh, finances. I've had to raise finances from, uh, you know, just normal normal commercial investors who um, I've had to convince one Afghanistan is, um, you know, will manage. And then, you know, it's not the, um, probably not the favourite, um, you know, place to, uh, to invest in. And, um, and, 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 and two, uh, that it's philanthropic. So don't be expecting dividends uh, tomorrow because, uh, you know, we've got lives to change, not, uh, bank, not bank accounts to fill. You know? <laughs> um, so that, that's probably been one of the biggest. Um, security, uh, I said, you know, I, I was sort of um, kidnapped in the early days. Um, security uh, was, 
wasn't sort of seemed a problem at the beginning, but we we soon overcame that when we held all the tribal gatherings. Um, you know, everyone recognised the sincerity. On the first gathering, there was 400 elders in Langaha province, and they, um, you know, they, uh, they, 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 we all had a gathering they, uh, in the middle of nowhere. It was, and um, I ended up in the Observer newspaper uh, because of it. But um, you know, and. There were 11 elders. They deliberated in two groups for about four or five hours while I'd sort of hung about. And um, and then the 11 elders addressed the, the, all of them. And then the final, the main elder, he, um, he, Babrak Shamari, his name was, he, uh, he addressed me in front of everyone and said, um, you know, we want to do this. We want to, you know, work with you to uh, go to normal crops, not opium and all the rest of it. And um, But the main reason, is, it's beautiful, he said, the main reason we want to do this is because you came here as a normal person without a badge, a gun, and a uniform. Thank you so much. And it was so powerful, that, 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 that the emotional drive. So, you know, you can see, um, you know, it's been bumpy, but we've fed into people's emotions and people have respected our sincerity. So we, we've managed. Um, Richie said, we usually start by asking about COVID and how people live their lives in the let, let, Let's turn to that now, because... Yeah. My guess is you haven't really let it get in the way very much. But what has uh, what has COVID meant for your plans and ambitions and momentum, James? <laughs> COVID, oh wow, yeah, um, it's been a pain in the ass for flying, that's for sure. But um, what can we do? Uh, COVID. So um, I think the, uh, the, the 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 best thing that happened to me um, with Plant for Peace, you know, th through COVID, was that I was stuck in the UK. Uh, my my wife and my youngest two and myself we live in uh, Yerevan in Armenia, um, although I'm uh, in southern Scotland at the moment. But uh, we live uh, and I, so I was stuck in the UK. So for eight months I uh, I stayed in a friend's um, friend's house in uh, on the edge of Manchester, and ended up going through the whole process with uh, one or two of the Plant for Peace team in uh, putting the strategy all down on paper with the UN and working with the UN. So for me, COVID was. Um, was uh, an opportunity to be stopped in my tracks because if I wasn't stopped in my tracks, I wouldn't have been probably focused enough to have sped the process up of working this all out with the UN. So I've, I've had a bonus from uh, COVID in that respect. Um, you know, I didn't see my wife and children for eight months, which is pretty upsetting, but, you know, you know, one has to dig deep through these times and, um, you know, and, you know, embrace the moment, you know, we could, uh, we could all be running around like, um, crazy all the time and we've had the opportunity one probably to spend time with our families two to slow down a bit and three to take note you know life is um life is not about um you know creating as many gray airs as we can as we run around you know as we have been all those years you know embrace a moment and you know try and take something from it look at it like it's a bit of a break in a way and slow down and enjoy the day you know? i love that gray, love that not gray hairs say again you, lo you love grey but not grey hairs. I like that. Yeah, well, mine are a bit white, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, especially calling from uh, from uh, as they say, sunny Scotland, where where most of the time it's grey. It's it's uh, probably suits you quite well from that perspective. Yeah. Um, also, James, um, I want to come on to a bit of a practical question. Um, so, so Lucy Hater asks. Um, so, talking in specific relation to your products. Um, how do you break through the bureaucracy and get your products into supermarkets? Um, is your charity linked to the products you sell, for example? Yeah, so it's, um, that's a great question. Um, obviously, uh, you know, I, I, I had an, a, an understanding, of course, of, uh, you know, the food chain, supply chain, supermarkets, retailers, because of uh, the fruit juice I um, created. So uh, that was, I was sort of uh, self-educating myself on getting that fruit juice to market. Um, obviously, I reinforced that sort of, uh, you know, self-taught education of the supply chain, I think, with Plant for Peace. But what enabled us to um, to trigger all that sort of activity, again, with retailers, Sainsbury's, Waitrose, Holland, about one was goodwill, two was influence of people. Um, you know, we uh, we made the uh, we made a, a, a range of um, so we did a concept scenario. Basically, we went we wanted to put from from Afghanistan product into major retailers. No one's done it. Even now, no one's still done it. Um, so we made a range of fruit bars using pomegranate and mulberry. Um, we, uh, we 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 exported the prod, produce, put and uh, produced it in um, Austria. Influence is what gave us the access to the supermarkets again. Um, for example, for example. Uh, Waitrose. We wanted to 
you know, present to Waitrose um, very gratefully, uh, you know, the uh, International Sustainability Unit of uh, the Prince of Wales, um, the team there contacted Mark Price at Waitrose and said, uh, you know, James Brett's coming along with some fruit bars. Please, um, please have a good look at them. You know, in other words, uh, you know, help him out. The goodwill, of course, of the whole nature of that product. So I'll, I'll just really quickly explain the product. For every single product we sell, we plant a tree in Afghanistan. I woke up yesterday morning, literally yesterday, to uh, last year's uh, tree cuttings. We buy the tree cuttings from the farmers. So a one pound, one pound nine fruit bar that we sold in Sainsbury's, Waitrose, Holland Barrett, for example. Um, we then take some of the money from that fruit bar. We buy a tree cutting from the farmer. We put it in our nursery. We grow it and nurture it for a year. So it goes from like a six inch uh, twig, basically, which we root um, to, a, to a sapling a meter high. And then we, um, you know, after a year, we give them to the farmers. So that one pound nine retail fruit bar generates $400 approximately per tree for a farmer. And it's his, his tree, his fruit. And then we further demand and, uh, and, and, and and buy the fruit from the from the farmer. So the actual products itself, you know, um, you know, any anyone who wants to contribute can tr- contribute from products. We also do non, uh, you know, we also now are starting non food uh, products. For example, you know, birthday cards, greeting cards, and all the rest of it. For every card someone buys, we plant a tree. That's our that's our message. For every single product sale, we plant a tree. Just before COVID, I was literally um, in discussions detailed discussions to the extent that fruit bars were on the uh, on the head of uh, procurement for Qatar Airways. You know, customers like that are phenomenal. They had, before COVID, they had 40 million passengers a year. We Can you imagine a fruit bar on each meal train? Nice video, Plant for Peace Qatar Airways partnership, the only airline in the world to, for example, the only airline in the world to, um, you know, where every passenger plants a tree through the course of a year. 40 million fruit bars, 40 million trees, I mean, it's ridiculous, the economics of that for the farmer. It's phenomenal. Um, you know, uh, so we did all that. We did all the concept. We um, put all the products into, uh, into Sainsbury's, Waitrose, Holland and Barrett. Um, and uh, and then, then there was two, two, two things that happened. One, I, uh, I, came, down with, um, I came down with cancer um, in 2017, as Mark said. I had, um, I had three types of cancer in the end, beat them all. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine months ago, I didn't have no air, you know, got a beard back on today. It's great, isn't it? You know, life goes on. And, um, uh, you know, so we felt that we'd done a whole, you know, we felt that we'd show, we'd proven the model, basically. We'd proven the model that you could go from Afghanistan to to, to major retailers. You can do it in the UK, you can do it anywhere in the world. Um, so, so we did that. Cancer came in and uh, struck me. Um, you know, we, you know, I had to rethink you know, I was led in, uh, led in a hospital bed in, uh, you know, in Swindon. Uh, you know, the surgeon told me, um, the doctors told me at least five, six times through the course of that period, I should let my family and I'm not going to make it. <laughs> I made it. I made it. I made it. And I'm not only did I make it, I'm, uh, you know, probably 10 times more motivated and stronger after that than I was before even, you know. So, you know, I, I sort of lost where I was going with the, uh, with the, with the question. But, um, you know, effectively... Every product we sell, we plant a tree. We stopped producing the fruit bars after the uh, when the cancer all happened. We realised, you know, I never went to Afghanistan to uh, to do uh, a project where you know small projects where I could change a village or change a community. I always said, if Plant for Peace doesn't work at a national level, I'd rather not do Plant for Peace. I want to do great change, great great things, you know. Um, so. We we well, after we proved the concept, we ceased uh, we ceased producing the fruit bars. We developed we've developed um, seventy odd products at the moment, ready to globalise, and we've got it to the point now where we only wait for the president's approval. Uh, James, amazing, amazing, amazing. Uh, 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 just a couple of things. Selena says, are the products in Australia? So if you want a sort of a bit of geographic expansion, there's an opportunity. Um, tr- truth be known, what's come out in the last couple of minutes is two really important things. One is deep down, you're an extremely entrepreneurial person. Um, and uh, we, we probably should have heard more about that. But just, you know, the flow of ideas and opportunities. But but I am g- I'm going to it's probably going to be the last question. So I'm going to try and tie a couple of things together. Matt's asked the question, what tips would you give everyone to overcome challenges? Now, you just kind of threw in there. I had cancer three times. I was told five or six times I might not make it. Uh, my, my wife was a leukemia nurse for many years and she 
observed that those that had a positive mental attitude were the ones that that made it through. Uh, so can, can you just tell us a bit more about how your battle with cancer played out? Again, how you overcome those odds. I've got in my, my mind an Avengers character. They should create a new Avengers character, this one that sort of absorbs all this pain and negativity and turns it into something amazing. Uh, maybe that's the next uh, line extension. But, you know, how, how do you get through that particular battle? Um, I mean, I, I'm quite fortunate and, you know, uh, try, I, I hope everyone can sort of embrace the sincerity of these words. I am fortunate that everything that has gone on in my life I, I'm never going to go through anything worse than what I went through. The trauma I suffered as a child, the trauma I suffered from the carrying the blame and the loss of my wonderful mother, um, I'm never going to go through that. The only, you know, there's only one fear I probably have in my life today. And the only fear I probably have is that I lose one of my children before I pass away. You know, And so, you know, without that fear, what have I got to lose? I wanted to die from all the trauma I went through. I wanted to die for 20 years. So when cancer came, it didn't, I, it wasn't, uh, you know, to some people, you know, and I'm, I'm sort of happy for those people. If cancer is the biggest thing they've had to overcome in their life, then I'm happy for them that that is the biggest thing because cancer was way down the list for something I had to overcome. I'd already wanted to die. I'm free. I'm a free person. I'm a free spirit. Nothing can, um, what's, what's going to break me? Only maybe if I lose a child before myself, nothing else. No, no, no. What can anyone do to me? I'm, I say it with sincerity. I'm free. I'm not scared of nothing. I go to the bank sometimes. Funny, when we first started, we had, I had to um, do Western Union cash to Afghanistan because uh, HSBC takes 37 days to transfer money and I'm buying like lorry loads of mulberries. So I go and take chunks of cash out of uh, Nat West, you know, and I go in there and they all know me in the, in the branch. Then I walk in, they say, here he comes again. You know, how much do you want? And I draw out a few thousand. They say, oh, do you need a bag? Do you need it? I said, who's going to mug me? Who's going to mug me? Like, if they really need it, they can have it. You know, if they really need it, they can have it. I'll give it to them. You see that? And, and, and you know, I'm grateful for everything I have in my life. I'm grateful that I have the relationship I have with my mum today. Do you know my eldest daughter, um, God bless her, amazing. I'm so uh, proud of her. She kept it quiet because she didn't want to upset me. She lives in Australia and they have National Suicide uh, Day there. And she did um, 3,000 press-ups in, uh, in a number of days uh, for that cause, you know? And she didn't want to tell me. She said, I said, why are you doing all these press-ups? And then in the end, she told me. I was so uh, proud of her. She said, I did it for your mum, Dad. I did it for Gran, you know? And my mum today would be a normal, a special, but normal grandmother if she was alive, you know? Physically alive. And today she's in spirit form, you know? And she's changing countries and she pushes me and my children love her to bits for who she is spiritually, you know? And if you've got that in your life, that power, that force, that energy, that embracement, you know, we live in a, we, we, we have good lives. We should be grateful that we have, you know, food on our tables, clothes on our back, children, you know, accommodation, cars to drive. It's, I know people who are their only form of transport, if they're lucky, is a donkey. Oh, come on, man. We're, we're rich in spirit and in, and in pocket. We are rich and we, we should embrace the moment every day. We should bounce out of bed, blue sky or grey sky. You know, life is a very beautiful and special thing and all the experiences, good or bad, they define us. And I wouldn't change any of mine, any, because the negative ones have, have become positive. Thank you, James. James, thank you. Honestly, and, and, and all I just want to say, you know, we're sort of out of time, um, but just a real absolute genuine thank you for, for what you shared with us this morning. It has really been so special to so many of us and, and certainly to me. Um, you've touched so many lives. You really have, and you continue to do so. And it feels like you're just at the beginning of what is going to be an exponential movement moving forward. And I'm really keeping my fingers crossed for you on, on that, for that phone call in the next couple of days because um, yeah, yeah. I know how much I just I just know how much that it means to you and how much that it means yeah. for the viability of what's coming next so absolute fingers crossed there and um, before I pass back to Mark just to say thank you I just want to share a couple of key things that I got away from this conversation so that the, the clearest one coming right through is the the way that you embrace life and and actually through the pain have been able to see the positive and and that's just you know so inspiring 
because all of us in our very micro ways, nothing perhaps is what you've been through, go through these micro moments of pain, but actually we need to see a different way. We need to reframe that. And I thought that was just, that was great. The other thing was around travel um, and travel to some of those locations, those harsh locations and the experiences you've had through that, you've clearly grown in character and as an individual, and that's brilliant. Um, the other one around gray, I love that notion. Um, you know, it doesn't need to be blue all the time. It needs to be gray, clearly not gray hairs, but gray in, in character and spirit. Um, the last thing, I'll, 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 well, the last two things, in fact, um, was, was around the instinctiveness that you, you lived your life with. Um, I feel that's, that's powerful, particularly as, as a lot of us are marketers on, this, on the show. Um, it really feels a lot of the time we get too obsessed in kind of looking for evidence. And actually what you've, the way you've lived has been so fulfilled because of that instinctiveness power you've had. And the final, the final thing I want to just end on for me is the words when you said you were able to be so successful because you didn't come with a badge, a gun, or a uniform. And I just think that's such an amazing takeaway for so many of us, about how we are able to cause great influence in the roles that we have without having to have a badge, a gun, or a yeah. uniform. Thank you, James. I'll hand over to Mark. Yeah, thanks, Richie. You, you, you picked out some, some of the great things that you said, James. Just a, a couple more. Um, you know, you, your expression of gratitude for some of the bad things that have happened and how you've pivoted from pain. I've, I've, I've heard it twice before, but I've really never heard anything like it from anybody else. It is incredible. Uh, and you talk about life goes on despite all the setbacks. Um, I've still got this Avengers superhero uh, sort of figure in, 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 my, in my head. Just a, a, call, a uh, comment from Philippa. This has set me up for the day and, and my year ahead. Thank you. And Philippa's just in the process of starting a business which is looking to do uh, great good in the world. Um, you, you don't need any letters after your name. Uh, that was <laughs> a, astonishing, um, you know, emotional, impactful. We're going to record the chat just to send that to you as a, as a small gift because there's so many nice comments. Um, I think the, but the best thing I can say is, um, James, you, your mother lives on in you. So um, yeah. thank you for, for this morning. Um, thank you. Okay. So just to tie up, next week, gather myself, we have Caroline Casey, another global activist uh, in disability rights, founded the Valuable 500, um, another amazing story of turning her uh, tribulations into triumph. But uh, for now, James, on behalf of everybody who's listened in and who watch on the playback, it's been an amazing session. Thank you so much. Uh, you've given us a great gift and uh, it's just such a pleasure to have the time with you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.